working in here is not good for a Florida boy. I'm telling you what. I almost wore my gloves up here, but again, sorry about that. If you need to do jumping jacks in the middle, push-ups, just go to the back, all right? Don't disturb anyone in front of you. If you're wondering where our worship leader is, they had their baby this week, Seth and Olivia did, which is great. So um, Atlas was born, I believe it was Tuesday, so be in prayer for them. They're doing well. Um, Seth's a dad. Still wrapping my head around Seth being a dad, but we're so excited for them and uh, praying salvation and faith over their son. And we celebrate life, we celebrate children, and we're just adding more and more to that kids' area. We're just going to explode back there, which is a good thing, right? God is working and, and building his kingdom. Uh, we're going to continue in Ephesians chapter 6. There's a lot of notes again in your bulletin, not as many as last week, but we covered a lot of ground last week. I want to start with an illustration of a movie. Anyone remember the movie The Last Samurai? Anybody? Tom Cruise? Um, not that I really love him, but he was in it. Um, so that was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. It was a really cool story. It's kind of a somewhat of a true story, but they fictionalized a lot of it, but it was based in Japan. And basically what was happening, the American military was there. Tom Cruise gets captured. He's like a general in the army. And there's this conflict in Japan. There's the, the samurais who are holding on to the original culture of Japan. And then they were being westernized in Japan. And the, the leader of the, cult, of the country was changing the culture. The economy was changing. They're putting more money into it, becoming more like other nations. And they were battling the Japan army with the samurais. Really fascinating story. It's, again, based on the 1800s. They fictionalized it, but what happens is Tom Cruise teams up with the samurais and they have this epic battle against the Japanese army. And there's this really cool connection they make and Tom Cruise falls in love with this very simple culture. But what it leads up to at the end is it's very sad ending, which I shouldn't start a sermon with, but it's just how it is, okay? They have the final battle and what happens is um, the samurais are going against the army and they pull out this new weaponry that's just basically a machine gun that's spraying bullets. And what, what happens is you see this realization of the samurai people. They're fighting against an enemy that they're not equipped or prepared for. And the battle is lost right when they step onto the battlefield because they don't have the same weaponry. They don't have the right armor. There's literally no chance for them to win. And you're, you're seeing even the, the army men of the Japanese soldiers looking about how wrong this is. They've got equipment that's far superior to the samurais. They're never, ever going to win that battle. It's a fascinating movie and interesting history. But it leads into what we started talking about last week with the battle. You and I, every single one of us, Christian or not, that we're facing in our lives every single day. Last week, we basically did an overview, kind of a biblical, theological look at what Satan looks like in the Bible, what God presents to us. And, and I want to remind us of that enemy and what we're up against to make sure we can prepare ourselves with the armor of God, which we're going to talk about the next four weeks, so that we can walk onto the battlefield with the right equipment, with the white, right weaponry, with the right thing so we can claim victory in our lives over the enemy, the Bible tells us that we are up against at all times. And so look at the first slide. Last week we said there's kind of three descriptions generally about Satan. Number one, he's a liar and he's a deceiver. Number two, he tempts. He, he's our tempter and Jesus was tempted Adam and Eve were tempted. You see it all throughout the Bible. It's not a sin for you and I to be tempted, but what we do when we're tempted is the choice that we have to make. Do we go God's way or do we give in to the flesh? And number three, he is the accuser. Maybe one of those resonated. Maybe we felt like that's a battle in our lives even this week. We talked about the accusations that Satan wants to pin on all the people in the world, especially Christians, that you're not good enough and you should be ashamed and you should be guilty and the dirtiness and the things that you've been a part of in your past and your history is that you're never going to live up 
to what God desires you to be. And we made the point that, no, you and I aren't good enough, but who is? Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who gives us the strength to walk with God. And so the hope that we have, I want to give you those three as well on the screen, is number one, we can overcome the lies because we know where truth is. And we're going to talk more about that today and how critical the armor of truth is in your life. It's the number one listed in the armor of God. Number two, temptation, we can overcome temptation because Christ's power lives within you. Jesus left He rose into heaven after he rose from the grave. He was taken, and he's waiting his second coming to come deal with sin and death and to bring us into eternal life with him. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God, which is your power source in this life in every aspect of the challenges that you face every single day. Ephesians 1 says you've been given every spiritual provision that you need. He has equipped those who believe in Jesus Christ. And so you have a way out of temptation. Number three, we can overcome accusations because Jesus covered over sin, guilt, and shame. Can we like amen that? That yes, we're talking about the enemy, we're talking about Satan, and we're being real about what the Bible says about that. But we know in Christ we've overcome. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who has overcome all those things with you. And so what I want to talk about, again, is Ephesians chapter 6. If you want to turn there, we're going to go through from 10 to 14 today, and we're going to camp out on 14. However, I want to camp for a second on a theme in the first uh, three or four verses, which I'll read right now. Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Where do you find your strength from? Where does the power source of your life that drives you and helps you overcome fear, doubt, insecurity, confusion, and question marks, where does it come from? Well, Paul says it has to come from the Lord. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I want you to circle or underline in your Bible the word stand. And anytime the writers of the Bible, they repeat something, It's repetition within a paragraph or a couple of sentences. They're trying to land a point in your heart that this is number one, that this is significant with repetition. It says, you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Verse 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to what? To stand. So three times. I love, I'm just reading this. This is my wife's old Bible that uh, she let me steal to preach from, and she has written down with an arrow at these verses, Pray over Griffin daily. I love that. Thank you for praying for me daily. Why? Because the enemy's real, and that's the battle you and I are facing every single day. And so I love this idea of standing, because what I feel compelled to encourage us as your pastor and preacher, and Don's going to preach a part of this sermon as well, is that as a Christian, we cannot be sitting idle in this world. We, we cannot get comfortable or stagnant or complacent and think, well, I got baptized and I gave my life to Christ and so I'll go to church and I'll do these things and think that everything's just going to kind of come together from there. This is a daily pursuit. And what Paul is trying to do with the, the Ephesus church is he's writing his final words. He's like, listen, there's a fight that you're in. There's a battle that you're facing, and you have to stand against the enemy that's coming against you. And by the way, you're equipped to do it. But will you make the decision to put on the armor and to stand firm against this enemy that's coming against you? And so the word stand is actually a theme throughout the Bible. We'll put it on the screen. A list is how we can stand against the enemy. This is incredible. We stand in grace 
We stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he paid the price on the cross for all sin, past, present, and future. We can stand in courage and in the strength of God. You can stand against the enemy in your faith, trusting that God is with you and always walking with you in this life. You can stand in Christian freedom, that you've been freed from the, the grasp of sin, is that he's wiped you clean and he's given you the ability to stand against the enemy, that you are free from the grips of this world and the grips of your flesh. You can stand in Christian unity, that you're in a room full of 300 plus people worshiping the same God that you are worshiping, that you are not alone in this journey. Those of you in life groups are putting yourself around people who are praying with you and digging into the scriptures and understanding more of what God has in store for you. The unification of the Holy Spirit with God's people is more powerful than any other unifying force in the world. And so you stand with the people next to you. You can stand in the Lord, that you have that relationship and his presence is with you. You stand in perfect and complete in the will of God. And so I love that. The question I want to ask is in your life, and maybe in the barrage of temptation or the barrage of accusations or lies or deception in your life, do you feel ready to stand against the enemy that the Bible tells us we're up against every day? And so he says that, you can stand. But the way that you do it and the way that you can fight is to understand what kind of armor you and I have to carry to fight this spiritual battle. If you're new to church and like your friend invited you and we're talking about Satan and all these things and it feels overwhelming, the, the beauty of this is the story is that we've already claimed victory, amen? And you see in the world, you see the darkness, you see the struggles. Literally, I was the other day scrolling through Fox News just just on my phone and just catching up with the headlines and the amount of dark and difficult, once I got past the balloon in the sky that everyone's really interested in, right? It, you just see all this hardship and you see the brokenness and you see these terrible stories of people suffering and struggling and all those things. You know that there's darkness. You see it, right? You see the brokenness and you see the struggle and the statistics of all the depression and anxiety and all those things. The reason we're in this room today is that this Bible tells us we have hope in Jesus Christ. Yesterday, today, and forever. And so what Paul leads us to is how do we put on this armor to fight this fight against the enemy? So go to verse 14, and for the fourth time he starts with the word stand. He says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So just for a few minutes, we're going to unpack the belt of truth. Everyone say belt of truth and breastplate of righteousness. That was a little longer. You were more subdued, but we got it, right? So belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness. Here's the cool thing about Paul. Uh, not for him, I guess, but in his missionary journeys, the context, he was in Rome and he was captured. And he'd write these letters a lot of times from prison, or we believe the book of Ephes or Ephesians was written when he was under house arrest. And so when he was being in house arrest, what was happening? You'd have a Roman soldier guarding the door of the house that he's living in. And so he's on a mission for Christ. He's been arrested because they don't like what he's talking about that there's this other kingdom the Romans don't like that so he's put under house arrest and what does he see walking past his window and his door every day a Roman soldier with all the things that he's wearing and what does he do this is how God works turns something worldly into something spiritual that you and I can understand and he starts to, to think about Roman soldiers going into battle claiming victory and defeating their enemies and he says this is how Christians are meant to guard and arm themselves for the battle we face. Now, what's interesting about Roman soldiers with the belt of truth, they would actually wear like a tunic that almost looked like a dress, okay? And so it was kind of open at the bottom, and it was like the undergarments that they wore. And so what they'd do is they'd put a belt on, 
And what the belt would do is is meant to be kind of pulling all the undergarments together. And you know that a Roman soldier was going into battle when they put on the belt. Because I heard another pastor say that the belt would actually tie up loose ends. And it would make sure nothing was kind of flowing or getting in the way or encumbering the soldier from going into battle. The belt was literally putting it on to shore up whatever is under the armor that you're going to put on because you're ready to fight. You mean business, and you're getting geared up to go into battle. The other thing about the belt is that that's what they put the sheath on to where they put the sword in. And so without putting on the belt, they couldn't prepare their weaponry to be ready for battle to put the sword in. It's what the weapon rested on for them to go into battle. And so that's the belt of truth, and that's the belt for the Roman soldiers. Now, what does that mean in relation to truth? To me, there's no coincidence that the first thing that that Paul would mention is the most foundational and most important thing you and I could wear, and it's the truth of God's word. It's, It's the truth, the foundational piece of your armor Your ability to fight against the ways of the world and the ways of the enemy, maneuvering his way into every part of culture and the world we live in, is to understand and wear with you every day the truth of God's word in your life. There's this incredible uh, interaction with Jesus in the book of John, which I'm going to pull a few scriptures from with Pontius Pilate. And this is basically when the Jewish people are putting him on trial and trying to get him to be killed. And Pontius Pilate's kind of the middleman trying to keep the peace. And they have this conversation. And listen to what the the conversation is about. John 18, verse 37 says, Pilate says, you're a king then, to, to Jesus. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the what? To the truth. His life was a testimony to God's word and the fulfillment of it. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, says Jesus. And to me, this is the question in our culture today that Pilate asked to Jesus. He says, well, what is truth? Straight to Jesus. To me, in our culture, people are trying to decide what truth is, right? I remember being in a conversation with a family member years ago, and we were talking about different things in the culture, and they weren't necessarily in the mindset of a biblical view, and we got into the conversation about how, well, you can have your truth, but then this person has their truth, right? Like, we want to have power and authority over what's right and what's true and what's real, and trying to decide what, what makes sense, and which totally negates the idea of, of what truth actually is. The question for you and I to begin to think about fighting these battles is, do you know what truth is and where it comes from? Does your framework of your life and the decisions you make and understanding what's going on in front of you and in the world around us, do you believe where truth is and where it comes from? And of course, just before that, Jesus telling his disciples about who he is in John 14 says to them, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so for every one of us in the room, we have to understand Jesus Christ made clear he is the truth. The word became flesh. Jesus fulfilling all righteousness and all the Old Testament prophecies and he says if you love me you will obey my commands you will follow me as if my words are truth in your life and it brings me to one of the challenges of wearing the belt of truth because the enemy creates confusion in our lives but to me Jesus creates clarity I know there's young people in the room navigating TikTok and Instagram and all the influencers and the the culture and what's pounding in your heads of what's right and what's wrong and what we should tolerate and what we should accept and if you believe certain things you hate people and you're against them and all those different things the enemy's so good at creating confusion to me even if the Bible makes you uncomfortable 
what it does do is it makes things clear. This is God's heart. This is God's ways. This is what God has created. And the only author of truth is God Almighty that made the world and everything in it. And what people want to try to do is have authority and power over what's right, what's acceptable, what we should do, what we should be, what we can do, and the changes we want to make, and all those different things to try to make the world in their image. God made the world, and God made you and I in his image. And we don't maybe always like what the Bible says. Maybe we wish it said cer certain things differently about certain things, but truth is truth according to God through his word. The enemy wants you to be confused. And like we said last week, did God really say this is what this is about this and about that part of the culture and what they think? John 1.17 says the law was given through Moses, but grace and what? Truth came through Jesus Christ. So the other thing I thought about truth is this. The truth actually makes us clean. I love this verse in uh, three verses in Ephesians 5. It says, husbands, it's kind of related to, to marriage. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Look at this. Cleansing her, the church, by washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless before God. So you see what it's saying is that the word of God is almost like a purification process in your life. Some of you have come to Christ in your 30s or 50s or later in your life, or maybe you had mindsets or you had thoughts about life or about God or about certain things and Maybe you've been in a sinful place and you lived in a certain way and you had mindsets and habits and ideas about life. And so when you come to terms with the word of God and it starts to speak against maybe some of your old beliefs or what you were taught when you were growing up by your parents or these ways of the world or whatever it may be, the Bible says the word, when you sink into it, and you open up your Bible in your living room and at your kitchen table, and you listen to it in your car, and you're just letting it wash over you. It's cleansing you of anything the world is trying to get you to think and believe. And it washes you towards God, and it purifies you towards Him, and it helps you remember and know and understand, this is my God. This is what He believes, and this is what He has established. And so in your life, when you wear the breath, or excuse me, the belt of truth, you're putting yourself in line with God. It's number one on the list, and it's a foundational piece that sets up every other piece of armor that you could put on to fight him. So how do you wear the belt of truth? Number one, I want to encourage you to start with Jesus. Whenever I get into reading the scriptures and I'll try to challenge myself to go to the Old Testament and Leviticus, my wife's reading Deuteronomy and loving it. She hadn't gotten to the second law part where it gets difficult, right? The end of Exodus gets tough. And some of you have tried to read through the Bible in a year and you're just like, man, Leviticus 19, like I'm done. I'm tapping out and it's over, right? Well, maybe you feel like in a dry place with like, do I even desire to read the word? What fires me up to get back to this is falling more in love with Jesus Christ. And so I'll go and I'll get into Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and I'll be reminded of what my God did by sending his one and only son into the world to die on the cross for my sins and to see the agony of Jesus in the garden awaiting his death waiting to be separated from his God. And I fall in love. I orient my heart back to this gospel of what Jesus Christ means to me and what he's all about. And if you ever, as a Christian, find yourself dry and lacking desire to want more of God, I'm begging you to go read what Jesus did for you, to never get bored of the gospel so that you are always reminded of man. 
The reason I pray and worship and say no to the world and say no to temptation and fight this enemy is because of that right there. Always. You may not know how to read the Bible. It may scare you to death. Start with Jesus. And it'll fire up your heart for more of God. Number two is to just figure out your habit and your ways of studying the Word of God. These are so simple. But, but what I want to encourage you with is in your life that you may be overwhelmed by it. You may be challenged by it. You may think you're not ready for it. There's so many resources to figure out how to study the Word of God. I was interested in the Bible app and how many devotionals they have. You literally type in, they have over 800 Bible study devotionals on the Bible app. I went to Amazon and I wrote in Bible devotionals this week. Over 80,000 different options. Maybe not all good, you have to sift through it, but over 80,000 options for you to be equipped and inspired and walk through different ways to learn the Word of God. Are you hungry for the truth? Because the enemy is trying to bring confusion in your life belt of truth the foundation of the armor secondly let's go to the breastplate of righteousness let me give you the definition of righteousness so we're on the same page together it's this to be in right standing with God or to be right in the eyes of God and so of course the breastplate is something that the soldiers would wear what right here on the chest to protect all the vital organs of that person. If they got hit in the heart or certain organs in their body, they'd be useless, they'd probably be killed in battle. And so the breastplate's like the chest protector. Protects the most vital things to keep you going and to keep you strong and moving forward. And so the idea of righteousness is that it's been given to us through Christ. Again, it's nothing to be earned We're told in the New Testament that we can't boast about it. It's by grace through faith in Christ that makes you right with God in his eyes. Theological term would be imputed righteousness into our lives. And so number one, the truth about righteousness, it can't be earned. It's a gift. And so Romans 3, 21 says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. It's given to us through our faith. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Righteousness, being right with God, Despite your history and my story and my past and my shortcomings and my sin that we all continue to struggle with, Jesus paid the price and made righteousness available to all people who accept him, give their life to him, and are baptized into a faith and a journey of a relationship with him the rest of your life. It's an amazing gift that none of us deserve. But the challenge, once you've given your life to Christ, isn't, am I right with God? Jesus did that. The challenge is this second part. The battle is living out this righteousness. It's like, how far with God can you go to realize there's no other way to live? To be all in with this Jesus who went all in for you to try to understand what surrendering this life means to honor and worship and praise this God for what he's done for you on the cross and joining in with his mission to build his kingdom, to help people in your life that are living in an unrighteous place, far from God, unsaved, caught up in the world and confused by what the enemy is trying to do and living your life in a way that draws more people to Christ, to be fishers of men, to be inviting your friends and neighbors to church to hear the gospel. 
It's to live out of righteousness to say, I choose no to sin and I choose yes to Christ. To overcome the same temptation and sin that you've been dealing with for years. To go deeper in your relationship and to not be stagnant in your faith. To say, God, I want more than just salvation. I want a deep, meaningful relationship with you in my life. To be hungry for more of that. Because what I've found in my life is faith is unraveled and I've given myself more into Christ and tried to pursue this, this relationship with the Holy Spirit is that there is such a depth with God. And I'm tired of being stagnant. There's too much on the line. I've got five kids that need to see a man that loves Jesus Christ every day. A wife that God's blessed me with, a family, a church, ministries, all those things. There's too much on the line to be sitting. And so how do we live out our righteousness? Romans 6, 11 through 13 says in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why would you choose Christ over the world? Do you want to feel alive? Do you want to feel God's presence in your life? Why do I want to pray every day and memorize scripture that helps me be equipped against certain sins in my life so I don't live there, so it doesn't affect my marriage, it doesn't affect the people around me? How do I, why would I do that? Because through Christ I'm alive. And Satan wants to work in the world to deaden your faith. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy your faith, your relationship with God. It's a fight. It is a battle for you and your heart. And so he continues, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Rather, I love this, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Waking up every day, the first thing on your mind is, God, thank you for the breath in my lungs. And thank you that Jesus Christ gave up his life for me. You did that for me. So today I live for you. Can you have that heart and that mindset? Offer yourselves to God as those have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. It's like a maturity in our faith to just overcome and overcome and overcome sin and mindsets and things like that. Why? God is ready to move in and through your life. He wants to change people's life through your life. He wants people to come to Christ through your testimony and your prayers and your service and your commitment. It's time to stand. It's time to overcome and to live out of the righteousness he's given us and not to live defeated and worried and fearful and anxious and overcome by sin and lust and temptation and whatever it may be. He's got more for you than that. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. You wake up every day right with God as a believer in Christ. So how do you do that? I'll give you two things and we'll take communion and end today. How do you wear the breastplate of righteousness? Number one, this is amazing. You clothe yourself with Christ. What does that mean? Romans 13, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Paul is talking about kind of the world we live in. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. He says, let us behave decently in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension or in jealousy amongst people. Instead, you don't wear those things. You don't wear sin. You don't wear darkness. What do you do? You clothe yourself with Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you make no provision for the desires of the flesh. What does that look like in your life? 
Do you walk into to work clothed with Christ? Do you walk into your house with your family clothed with Jesus, praying for the Spirit of God to flow through you and the fruit of the Spirit to just emanate through your words and your thoughts and the way you look at your spouse and the way you speak into your family members, your coworkers, the people you're leading? When people see us, they're meant to see Jesus Christ. We look different from the world. We're set apart. We are separate from the ways of the world. How can you clothe yourself with this amazing Christ? Secondly, and finally, you choose to guard your heart. You guard the most vital organ in your life. From your heart is your desires out of the overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks. Your heart is incredibly vital to God. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And so, parents, how do you pour more of Christ into the hearts of your kids? Don't just rely on an hour at church every week if you make it on time. Don't just rely on a 30-minute sermon every week. How do you pour more of Christ into your heart? How do you strengthen your heart against the enemy? How do you not allow the enemy to take your desires to the things of the world and to your flesh and to the temptations that are in front of you? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the truth of God protecting your most important parts of you. I want you to take a moment with the Lord if you want to get your communion ready. And we're going to end with some time with the Lord. And I want to just set you up to have a moment with him. This time is to be reminded of our salvation. It's to be reminded of what Christ has done on the cross. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, acknowledge that he paid the price for us on the cross of our sins. And rose again to give us hope. We would love to walk you through what the gospel means to your life. But maybe in your life, truth is a battle. Maybe you have a desire to dig deeper into the word of God. Maybe you know that you need more of Christ to cover you in your life. Whatever you feel compelled to pray for this morning, let's number one, thank him for the cross, his body and his blood. And then let's pray for whatever you feel led to pray for. What part of this armor do you need more of in your life? So, Father, today we honor you. As always, we remember every week what you did on the cross. You sent your perfect son to take our place. The only way we could be righteous is through Christ. If there's anyone in this room that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that you would just compel their hearts with the truth love them. You care for them. You've made a way for them to be in a relationship with you. And so God, as we navigate the armor of God that you've laid out for us, that we are meant to put on every single day to fight against the ways of our enemy, the battle that we're in, whether we know it or not, give us the strength to stand firm, to know that you are greater than he who is in the world. Your spirit equips us and strengthens us. Your word is powerful. Your word is our protector, God. Help us wear righteousness every day and to live and to think and to act out of the truth that you have made us right in your eyes through Christ. And we can live freely knowing that you love us and you care for us and you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Thank you for your blood. We honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen.